Welcome to the program. I'm Nima Abu Ardi and we're at the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, the capital of Qatar. Now, experts from around the Arab world are gathered here to discuss this region's growing demand for power. It's a hot topic given that many are struggling to generate enough for their own use. Also coming up this week, Feeding the future. We look at how Qatar is trying to improve food security for generations to come. An heir of royalty, the Sultanate of Oman's main airline has a new business plan, but will it work? Making money from movies. We're at Abu Dhabi's film festival finding out how companies are competing for business from visiting stars. And the entrepreneurial astronaut, one of the world's first space tourists, tells us what plans she has for boosting technology in this region. But first, like many Gulf states, Qatar relies heavily on imports to feed its rapidly growing population. More than 90% of the food consumed here comes in from abroad. The government realises this isn't sustainable and is now investing in its food security. So how does Qatar plan to feed its future generations? Stephanie Hancock has been finding out. <laughs> Early morning at Qatar's main fruit and veg market, and customers are jostling to secure the best bargains of the day. Most of the shoppers here are on low incomes and are keen for their Qatari rials to stretch as far as possible. Uh, since three months, all prices increased. Uh, vegetable, fruit, fish, meat, everything uh, too much high. Uh, really, it is very difficult for us because we have fixed salaries. We, we, we cannot afford all the prices of, uh, of uh, vegetables and, uh, and fruit. Traders and customers here say food prices at the market have been rising in recent weeks. And if you look closely at where the produce comes from, you'll see why. We've been at this market for about an hour now and we've yet to find any goods for sale that have actually been grown here inside Qatar. Almost all of the produce you can see has been imported from other countries. Now the problem with importing so many goods is the question of price. It's difficult to control the price of goods but there's also the question of supply. If the supply chain into Qatar was for whatever reason interrupted, this entire market would be empty. Qatar imports a staggering 90% of all its food, and the government here has now set up a special food security task force, which will invest millions of dollars in agriculture to secure a decent food supply for the country. The chairman of this agency told me warning bells began to ring during the food price crisis of 2008. This was an alarm for us, and we said we need to act right now in order to prevent our nation from going through the same crisis, perhaps more severe in the future. We don't know. Because countries are sovereign and countries can put export restrictions. And we have seen this summer uh, one of the best examples, Russia putting an export restriction on wheat. Russia being the third largest exporter of wheat. We don't have that power to exert any control over the supply chain beyond our borders. And acting now is to mitigate the risks of the future. At this government-run farm on the outskirts of Doha, the wheels of change are in place. This new farm is growing hundreds of hectares of green fodder, which is used as animal feed. Normally, much of this has to be imported from overseas, but this farm is now one of the country's biggest suppliers. But while the scale is impressive, a quick look at the landscape here tells you about the challenges that Qatar faces. Qatar is very vulnerable. It's a desert, and as everybody knows, deserts mean not much water, and that's very much the case here. So if you're wanting to increase farming to any extent, water would be a very severely limiting factor. So the opportunities to increase farming, to produce more food, are very, very limited indeed. But Dr Mohammed al Atia is not a man to let a small thing like a desert get in the way of his ambitions. 
In just three years, this businessman cum scientist has turned these salt pans in a remote corner of Qatar into truly arable land. The soil here is saltier than seawater, but using cutting-edge biotechnology, Dr. Mohammed has created an experimental farm capable of growing everything from flowers to sweet corn. We have to find out, we have to search for a solution that can keep us to some extent self self-reliant or self-sufficient, you know. And it is very important, especially, you know, Qatar uh, rich in oil and gas revenue, actually. We have to uh, use this revenue for, for uh, agriculture uh, research and development. It is very important for our coming uh, generation. Qatar is one of the last places on earth you'd normally want to farm in, but it has no choice. To wrestle back control over food supply, Qatar has a huge challenge to turn this harsh environment into land capable of growing enough food to feed a nation. Stephanie Hancock reporting from right here in Doha. Now, this region might be energy rich, but it has power problems. There's a mismatch between demand and supply. And this week, experts from around the Arab world have gathered right here in Doha to discuss how to cope. Well, I spoke to the head of Qatar's electricity company, Fahd al muhannadi and asked him what he thinks the solution is. There has been, uh, in the past, Countries have committed their uh, energy supply, that's gas, to different parts of the world without reviewing the requirement for the same energy. And they have gotten to this mismatch, whether they are short or where they, are, they have abundant supply, they don't know what to do with it. I think in the future, they will be a closer look at both commodity to make sure that there is a very close link between the two. But not every country is as lucky as Qatar. They don't have your gas reserves. Kuwait, which is energy rich, has asked for your help in the recent past. So what is the situation out there? We have supplied Kuwait with electricity during the, the situation when Kuwait, uh, Kuwait were in need for, for power. And we supplied also Bahrain. So the grid now uh, facilitates that we can supply. And as you correctly said, we have surplus power and we can supply at any time Kuwait or any other country in the Gulf. Now, unfortunately, the grid that has been developed in the GCC is only meant for an emergency supply, but it doesn't provide a long-term reliable supply. And the solution is? The grid that now been developed should be enlarged to facilitate that any country or even producers of electricity in those countries to have the flexibility to supply other countries with power. Are you saying that gas is the answer for Qatar? You will never need supply from outside? I, I believe that we have the highest figure of, of power surplus in the Gulf and I believe in the Middle East. But you see, we keep on hearing that the GCC is going to unite in terms of, say, the currency or the power grid that's been talked about. But in terms of practical things and things getting done, we're still waiting. You know, the grid just been commissioned last year. You know, it's not even one year old. The connection is only between Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar and Bahrain. Now, yet the Emirates is to be connected very soon and then it's going to be Oman. So I think we have to give it the time. Fahd al muhannadi the head of Qatar's electricity company, speaking to me earlier. Now, the Gulf is home to some of the world's most profitable airlines, and concerns have been raised recently that they could be enjoying unfair advantages compared to their European rivals. But not all of the region's airlines boast good health. Gulf Air says Bahrain will pump a billion dollars into the airline, and Oman Air, which has faced a turbulent few years, has just submitted a new five-year plan. It'll face closure if it doesn't work. So what's to say that this plan is the solution? Philip Hampshire has been finding out. Keeping planes flying isn't the easiest job in the world, either for pilots or the men who run the airlines. Take Oman Air. The Sultanate's flag carrier three years ago ran into financial problems. They needed an injection of cash that saw the government raise its stake in the company from 30% to 80% to keep their doors open for passengers. Now, 
they've got a new five-year business plan to get back to profit. They're up against the clock. Unlike rivals with deep pockets like Emirates or companies with wealthy backing states like Etihad or Gulf Air, which this week received a billion dollars from the government of Bahrain, if Oman Air doesn't make it work this time, it faces the very real threat of closure. So can they really weave their way between the feet of rivals and flourish? We are very much focused on point-to-point -point traffic. Why point-to-point? -point? Because Oman has got a unique advantage. It's got a culture here, it's got a beautiful scenery, it's got so much to come and visit for that, um, you know, over the next 15, 20, 25 years, I can see Oman coming into its own, standing out as a very different place to visit. A major part of the plan is to generate extra revenue from ancillary services. Filling planes with passengers is a volatile and highly competitive business. But as the main airline at Muscat International, Oman Air can use its dominant status to sell its products to anyone who lands here, from aircraft maintenance to cleaning to baggage handling and support services. It's a model that's already been tried and tested by the major North American airlines, and it's worked well. This year, the, American, the North American carriers have made a lot of money. But all that money has been made because of ancillary revenue. Bag, uh, paying for the extra bag, paying for uh, uh, changing uh, itineraries, etc. And if you take these away, their core business did not make a lot of money. I mean, that takes it from something about three billion, maybe around a hundred million for the whole U.S. carrier. Uh, U.S. carrier. Another big area of potential profit is catering. Margins are higher in the food industry, and anyone landing and turning a plane around is a potential customer in need of restocking their galleys. The operation here is running so well, they even sell their sandwiches to the big chain coffee shops inside the terminal. We're building a travel group here. So uh, the Oman Air Group, which comprises of the airline, the ground handling operation at the airport, catering and engineering, as well as the holidays and leisure side, uh, will all contribute to the revenues of the company and uh, the business plan has us breaking even in year four and making a small profit in year five. Of course, if you walk around the short-term car park here at Amman International Airport, you'll also find that there's clear evidence for the services here from another rather unlikely source. There are dusty vehicles dotting the landscape, all of which belong to expats who chose this country because it's slightly safer or quicker or more convenient to get out of the region in a hurry. The security Western expatriates feel while living in Oman, along with the rapidly growing tourism and the steady influx of talent needed to service the oil industry, all means Oman Air has a strong base market from which to rebuild. the skill and luck to make its plan work. Philip Hampshire reporting from our man there. Right, we're going to take a short break now. When we come back, we meet one of the world's first space tourists. She made her millions from technology and is now getting ready to take off in the Middle East. Welcome back to the program. I'm Nima Abu Arde, and we're at the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. Over to Abu Dhabi now, which has been hosting its fourth annual film festival. Now, the capital of the UAE isn't known for its film industry, but it is trying to create one, and one where directors, scriptwriters, and producers aren't the only ones to benefit, as Katie Watson found out when she went behind the scenes. Film festivals are usually glamorous affairs. The gold paint everywhere just adds to the glitz. But making sure the festival goes to plan involves a lot of organisation. From furniture moving to making sure the menus are in place for the evening parties, that's good business for some. In Europe for the moment, nothing, nothing good happened. And, uh, and I decided to come here to, to start working. And here in a few days we arrive to find a lot of work to do. All the taxes that you have to pay normally in Europe, 
you, you got it in your pocket here. It's, it's easy. They, they bring you from Europe and they pay all your all the hotels, they pay everything, everything. But the money's well earned on the ground. Last year, the festival attracted nearly 43,000 film goers. That number's expected to be even bigger this year. So lots of glasses to be filled. Abu Dhabi's film industry may be small, but interest in the festival is growing. Organizers say they've earned as much money from ticket sales in the first three days of this year's festival as they did for the entire festival of last year. And as the festival grows, it means business opportunities for many, and not just for catering an organization that you can see here. The glamour of the red carpet, even if it is under wraps for now, is luring new kinds of businesses to the festival. This is the Middle East's first swag lounge. The idea is that VIPs come into this room and take a load of freebies home with them. Companies have to pay to be part of the swag lounge, and then they have to bear the costs of lending or giving away their products to the VIPs too. It's a costly enterprise for local businesses, but they think it's worth it. Jewelry is expensive, <laughs> and gold is on the rise. That's, that's something we know. But I mean, in terms of the gifts that I'm giving away uh, to the A-listers, it's a great opportunity for Bil Arabi, and uh, because these people will take this uh, bracelet with their uh, letter on it back home, and it's a nice souvenir from this part of the world. But it's also something that international companies want to get involved in. The regional market here is a lucrative one. For us. It's really important that, especially some um, target like um, the royal family, they will come in the lounge. Here in the uh, Middle East, it's really important that like, the royal family is wearing a one pair of sunglasses the day after. Like, uh, you will sell like thousand and thousand sunglasses because local people will buy like 20 pair each. So it's much more important for us that they're wearing sunglasses, our brand, than Brad Pitt. This growing business interest in the festival is what the organisers were hoping for. Initially fully funded by the government, it had a five-year plan to slowly get more businesses on board. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, we try to, uh, first of all, to establish the festival in the city and to make a name and a brand for the festival so we can convince, you know, other sources to jumping and on sponsoring the film festival. We have sponsors for this year and the years to, uh, that passed. But also, I think, you know, we want to, you know, ask less uh, from the government and make sure that, you know, the sustainability of this film festival continues on the private sector as well. As the festival gets into full swing and big names arrive, organisers hope they'll boost the profile of Abu Dhabi as a filmmaking hub. And businesses hope the stars will boost their profile at the same time. Katie Watson reporting from Abu Dhabi there. On to the final frontier now, and Iranian-born Anoushe Ansari became one of the world's first so-called space tourists back in 2006. She's also a technology entrepreneur and is investing heavily in this region. So how does her experience exploring space help with her plans for technology down on Earth? It was an incredible experience that's very difficult to put put to words, but it's something that uh, impacts you emotionally, physically. It changes your life. It changes the way you view your life. It changes the way you view the world. What brings you here? Prodia has uh, introduced this product that makes people's digital lives simplify. Uh, our lives have been very complicated by all these devices and applications. We love it, but it's also a hassle to make it all work. Now, you're based in the US. I assume the R&D mostly happened there. So why choose Dubai? to launch this and with a local provider. I'm from Iran. I was born in Iran. I moved to the United States when I was 16, but uh, still I'm from this region. And uh, I wanted this product to be launched from the Middle East for the first time. Uh, I want there be uh, a technology to be first launched from this area. And uh, we have talked to several partners. We've chosen Anayu as our regional partner. And they are um, a company that was formed by Du, which is a local operator in UAE. But Anayu will be operating throughout the Middle East and North Africa. But we keep hearing that the local governments, the governments of the region want to create knowledge-based economies. It hasn't happened. What's holding it back? 
in the MENA region, the hurdles that has to be overcome for this uh, technology and IT business to flourish. First, there are some regulations that probably needs to be looked at. For example, uh, you know that voice over IP is uh, not welcomed here in some of the regions. But also, um, I believe that a lot of companies bringing uh, technology and applications here are doing it uh, sort of based on their experience in US or Europe uh, without changing it at all. And the users here approach some of the things differently. So there's some barriers, cultural barriers that has to be overcome. You're the fourth private citizen to go into space as a space tourist in the world. What do you make of this region's space initiatives? Uh, there's a lot of activities, uh, obviously, in areas of just launching satellites and satellite communication. But the area that I'm very much interested in is uh, actually exploration of space uh, and uh, personal exploration of space for people going to space. And I know there has recently been an investment in Virgin Galactic, which I'm very familiar with because uh, Richard Branson was one of the uh, people who believed in this uh, when the Ansari X Prize was launched, which my family sponsored. And they have uh, gathered some investors and interests here in this region, and they will be building a spaceport here, I've heard. Anusha Ansari, the head of Proteus Systems, speaking to me earlier. Well, our time is very nearly up for this week. I do hope you've enjoyed the program. Before we go, though, let's see how the region's main markets finish the week. And remember, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. Now, next week, we're finding out how Syria's government is getting help from the private sector to operate its airports and power plants. It's part of the country's strategy to encourage private enterprise. But at what cost? Until then, from me, Nima Abuwarde, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you.